<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming tonight to our Prairie Univers University event. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. The Mount View Wisman School District is honored to present to you somebody who has fought and continues to fight for the rights of all. She has been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama, is the founder of the National Farm Workers Association, civil rights leader and activist, mother, educational advocate, founder and president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation. The originator of the motivating phrase to all Americans, si se puede, yes we can. Please enjoy this short video clip. Dolores is an icon. She's a civil rights hero. She's the first general that I followed into war. She's not afraid to speak truth to power. Dolores Huerta, who is an old friend of mine. The FBI knew how dangerous Dolores was. Dolores came up with the slogan, Si se puede. Yes, we can. You were a young girl growing up in America in the 40s. You must have had a dream. After I had seen the miserable conditions of farm workers, Cesar Chavez said, we have to organize a union. So you had this ambience all around you that you could really change the world. It was beyond question the largest gathering on behalf of farm workers in California history. I wish they'd all go back to where they came from. We had no labor troubles. She wasn't asking for permission. She just did what needed to be done. She has such a firm belief in what she's doing. We've never given up. That she infects you with it. Dolores Huerta. 90,000 people were poisoned in the fields of the United States of America. The farm workers founded the whole idea of environmental justice. Men were threatened by her power. She's a very volatile individual. She's an insult. People wanted to see her in a more traditional role. I left a couple of my children behind. That's part of the sacrifice that we made and that we had to make. And it still pains me when I think about it. People in power have no idea of the true heroes of this country. I would not have been able to see what's hidden in the fields of our country without the words. We're knee deep in sexism when it comes to why she isn't studied and why people don't know her. Latina girls need to see statues of you. We really got to set the record straight. I mean, women cannot be written out of history. Y'all with violence! It is an honor to introduce to you Ms. Dolores Huerta. Good evening. Buenas noches. can do better than that. <laughs> Otra vez, good evening. Good evening. Buenas, noches. Buenas noches. There you go, Dolores, that's our district. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly is a pleasure to have you today. Um, we appreciate your time. And I have a few questions that come from our English language learner acquisition committee uh, at the district level. These are parents who volunteer their time to help us make decisions uh, that are very important to the work that we do. Very recently, we noticed that you've definitely been in the news, um, working and helping with campaigning, but also very involved in education. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and your recent passion of what you're working on in education? Well. Uh we know that uh, in California, we used to be number one. 
in education in the whole United States of America. Now we are number 43. We're at the bottom of all of the states in the amount of money that we spend for each student in our, in our school system. And that is wrong. And we think, well, how did that happen? Well, two things happened. A lot of people came to California to live here. Uh, they like the weather, right? It's nice. Uh, but the amount of money that were people were paying in taxes to support our school system, that went down. And so as a result of that, uh, we, we, try, we have to change that. that. And uh, two things happened recently in the last few years that when people voted in the election, they voted that the wealthy people, the ricos, had to pay more money in taxes. So the propositions that were passed, Proposition 30, Proposition 55, and people all over California voted in the elections. So people who make a million dollars have to pay 3% more in state taxes. If they make $250,000, they have to pay 2% more. And if they make $250,000 a year, if that's their income, they have to pay 1% more. As a result of those two laws passing, we now have $9 billion a year that is coming into our state revenues, and that money is mostly going to education, okay? Yeah. So that's good. But we know that we're still not there yet, and so in the 2020 election, uh, we're going to pass another proposition It'll be for people like you to vote on it, and that proposition will make the big, uh, the big uh, uh, commercial property owners like Chevron, Disneyland, many of the people here in the Silicon Valley pay their fair share of property taxes, okay? Yeah. And, that, and that, when we pass that one, it will bring in $11 billion a year for education, okay? It's going to be called Schools and Communities First. So uh, you will be hearing more about that, uh, not this year, but next year uh, in the general elections, and we'll be coming back and to, to tell you about that. So we all have to work very hard uh, to make sure that we pass those initiatives. But there's one other thing, too, that's very important, is that uh, in 2020, uh, there's going to be the census. And we have to make sure to tell everybody that they have to be counted. So every person that does not get counted, that community will lose $15,000 for every person that is not counted. And a lot of people, they don't think it's important. A lot of people might be afraid to get counted. So we have to tell them, no, you have to make sure that you get counted because if not, where you live, money that would come from the federal government to your community will not be there. So that's the things that we have to start talking to our friends, to our relatives, to everybody. Be sure that when they do the census count in April of 2020 that you get counted, okay? So those are things that we can do, personally do, to make sure that we get more money for our schools. Thank you, Denise. Can you talk a little bit more about your work with suspension rates and, and how that's going to influence policy and, and what we do in schools every day with children? Well, one of the things that my foundation is doing that we organize the parents. So we have meetings in, the, in the, <clears throat> we have meetings in parents' homes uh, so that they can understand how the educational system works, how the discipline systems work and so that they will know what they have to do in terms of making sure that their children are represented in the school system. Uh, because a lot of parents, we have a lot of parents who are immigrants, and they don't really know how our school system works in the United States of America. And many people that come from other countries, uh, they say, well, you're not supposed to interfere with the teacher. So take the kid to school, take the student to school, and leave them there. But we know in the United States of America, because our teachers are so overwhelmed and our teachers don't have enough support, 
that we need the parents to also be there to support the teachers and to help them. So the parents have a big responsibility to make sure that our, te that our students get all of the help that they need, and not, uh, not only uh, with their homework, but also you know, create the kind of, of a, an atmosphere at home where children can learn. And the world is so much more complicated now than students have a lot of things that they have to learn that maybe people didn't have to learn when I went to school, you know? So that's why it's so important. And thank you, all the parents that are here. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Definitely give yourselves a round of applause. We certainly have an active community here. Um, you seem really passionate. Do you, do you have teachers in your family? Or what's been your experience with teachers personally? Well, I used to be a teacher. Yeah, I used to be a teacher when I was young. I left teaching uh, to become an organizer. I have a daughter who's a teacher who taught for 15 years in Los Angeles. I have a son-in-law who's a teacher right now. Uh, in the Los Angeles School District. And so education has always been a very big part of our family. And uh, not only that, when we think of education, we have to, people have to know how our government works, right? Uh, we have to know so many things. And education is actually the foundation of our democracy. It's the foundation of our democracy. During World War II, when we were at war, we had this big war going on then, and our president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he said they wanted him to take money from schools and libraries to put it into the war. And he said, no, I will not take one dime out of our schools. I will not take one dime out of our libraries because education is the foundation of our democracy. But we know we have to improve that. And we have a big educational system, but there's some things that we need to teach that are not being taught now. And in California, they just passed a law that they have to teach ethnic studies because we know we have a lot of racism in our society. And what, what our children need to be taught from starting with kindergarten or pre-K, how are the people that, that really built the country, the Native Americans, Los Indios, they were the first slaves. You know, they were the first slaves uh, that built a lot of the infrastructure. And then the, African that they, the Africans that they brought from Africa who were slaves, who we need to teach in our schools, they are the ones that built the White House where the president lives. They built the Congress, where we have all of our senators and our Congress people. We don't teach that in our books. And people have to know that it was the African slaves that built a lot of the infrastructure of the United States of America, and it was the immigrants, the people that came from Mexico, the people that came from China, from Japan, from India. They built the railroads, you know? There's so much of, of our infrastructure even before many of the immigrants from Europe came here. And so we have to teach that so that our children, our children of color, can get the respect that they need. And so our Anglo children, our white kids, they won't be fed that poison of white supremacy or white privilege. <laughs> and and I, let me add one other thing. Uh, we need to teach, uh, teach uh, our children uh, about the working people, about the farm workers that feed us. Not too far from here. In fact, this area before, it used to be agriculture. Cesar Chavez and his brother Richard and all the family, they worked all of this area here as farm workers. You know, And uh, people don't uh, really appreciate the people that work with their hands. And we have to teach people that. And I'm going to say this, and I think people, if I ask the audience, I'm going to ask somebody to hold up their hand, how many people know how we got the eight-hour day? You know, we all know people work eight hours a day, right? We know people have weekends off, that they don't have to work on weekends. But how did we get the eight-hour day? Well, in Chicago, in Chicago, Illinois, the people there were working for the eight hour day. This is many years ago. But the people that were trying to get the eight hour day, 
the union leaders, the labor leaders, they were executed. They were hung. So we could get the eight hour day. Now I don't think any of us here in this audience know who they were. We don't know their names, but we need to know their names, right? We need to know their names uh, so that we can remember the sacrifices that they made so we could have a weekend and an eight hour day. So, and, and to honor the people that work with their hands, like the janitors at the school, or the people that make the food for the children, you know? You bring up some very good points of, of being appreciative, but also knowing our full history, right, as a, as a community, uh, and that it benefits all of us, right? Black, brown, white children, all of us benefit from understanding our true histories. Um, you mentioned that you left teaching to become a leader, to do some of the many things that you're talking about, and I see your passion rising. How did you have the strength to be a great leader despite so many obstacles of your time? Well, I think uh, uh, when you talk about someone being a leader, uh, and I like to quote Cesar Chavez. They asked Cesar Chavez once, who is a leader? He says, the people who do the work. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what makes a leader, is somebody who is willing to sacrifice and to put their time out there uh, to do the work. And when uh, people know that you're working for them and are working on their behalf, and then they will follow you. And then that's when they call you a leader, right? And you don't just say, I'm a leader. You have to go out there and do the work. And, uh, cause, and, and the work has to be not for yourself. It has to be uh, the work that you do has to be uh, to make the lives better for other people, not to make life better for yourself. Uh, to be a giver, not a taker. I think that's a good point, don't we agree, audience? Our families want to know, what is the reason for all your work? It sounds like you have a core belief of giving, right? And not taking, and that's at the core of who you are. But we want to know, you know, would you have done anything different along the way? And why this work, Dolores? Oh, well, we know that there's a lot of things that have to be corrected in our society, and we know that people, we're the ones that can do that. We're the ones that can make the difference. But a lot of people don't know that. They don't realize that they have the power to change things. Like when we started organizing the farm workers, and I'm, I'm sure some of you in the audience I have parents or grandparents that will, will tell you that here you have farm workers working out in the fields and they don't have any toilets. And they're working you know, way out of town. There's no gas stations nearby. There's no porta potty out there. And you say, this is why? This is wrong. You know, there's no drinking water for them in the hot sun. And so you say, we've got to change this. But in order to change it, the people that are being affected are the ones that have to make the change. You know, so basically what we did is we went, success of Chavez and myself, and we talked to the workers. And we said, you don't have to put up with this. And the one thing that people have to do is overcome their fear. They have to overcome their fear because they were afraid. And so we told them, yeah, one person can't do it by themselves, but all, if all of you come together, then we can make it happen. They didn't have unemployment insurance for the farm workers. So when they finished the season, they couldn't draw a check. They had to go follow the crops to go to another place or another state to work. And so basically, we just had to convince people. And that's what we have to do. When we think of the things that we need to change right now in our United States of America, we can do it. That's the one thing we have to understand that we, the people, have the power to make the changes. The things that we're talking about, you know, passing the laws. And so that's what we did. You know, we did the marches, we did the strikes, but ultimately, we had to pass the laws that gave the farm workers and made the growers say, you have to have a toilet for the workers, especially for the women, right? You have to give them cold drinking water. You have to give them the right to organize. But we had to work to get good people elected to the legislature, and then we had to remind them and put pressure on them to vote for the laws that we needed. 
do you know that uh, unemployment insurance, which is you know the check that workers get when they're not working, right? All people have it except the farm workers. Well, the the governor then Ronald Reagan, it passed the legislature three times, and he wouldn't sign the bill to give the farm workers unemployment insurance. Okay. So eventually, uh, when Governor Jerry Brown got elected, then he signed the bill, not only for the farm workers to have unemployment insurance, but so they could have the right to organize, to make sure that they have the bathrooms in the fields by law. You know? And so it's about government. And, but, but we are the ones that have to elect the good people to make sure they sign those laws. Thank you, Dolores. So far, you've and definitely your audience. Are. You make it sound so simple. Doesn't she? She said, just change it. <laughs> so far tonight, I think we've heard, stand up and be counted, Census 2020. It makes a difference in our school district and our communities. I think we also heard from you, vote, support legislation in any way, and have a voice. We just have more questions about what do you recommend to our students and our families, particularly students of color, but as you can see, we have a wide variety here that are invested in the Mountain View Wisman School District community. What do you say to us on the night of the State of the Union and the State of the State Address? This is our state, right everyone? And we're spending our night with Dolores. <laughs> Yeah, we're competing. So no matter, tell us what to do. Speak to us. Well, I just uh, want to ask everybody uh, to please stay informed. Know what's going on. You know, with parents, you got to not only watch the novelas, you know, but we got to watch the news also. Uh, and sometimes the local news will not give you what you need to know. Sometimes you just get the crime report, right? That's how you get on the local news. So you have to reach the other sources of news like... Uh, MSNBC, uh, Amy Goodman, who comes out at 6 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock, uh, alternate sources of, of, of information uh, uh, to, get, to get the news to see what's going on in our country. Uh, stay informed, but the other thing is stay involved. And I know that children can also do it. You know, my children, as you may know, I had 11 children, right? But my children were very, very involved. I would take them to meetings with me, uh, take them to demonstrations. Yeah, whenever you go on marches, please take the children and go on marches. If there's a protest march going on, join it and take the children with you. Your, if your nieces or your nephews or whoever it can, because when children go on a march, they feel the power of people coming together. They feel the energy and then they get that experience. And the main thing is it builds up their courage. And this is the main thing that we have to do is uh, overcome uh, this inhibition that we have and, and the, the, the thought that we can't make a difference. Every single person can make a difference. Every single person can make a difference. But you've got to stay involved. Uh, so I like to say, get off of the sidewalk and come into the street, OK? All right. Get off the sidewalk and come into the street. Because uh, you know you count. Uh, uh, cada persona cuenta, you know? Uh, every person can make a difference, but you've got to, uh, you know, get out there. And it takes time. It takes time. Yeah, you know, it, you might have to give up doing something that you like uh, to be able to go on that march or that protest. And the other things that we have to, I think this is important too, is that uh, with our young people, especially we have to teach our young men in our school system how to respect women. How to respect women. And then we need to teach our young women how to be strong. And that they have to understand that they are equal to men. Maybe not physically, but intellectually. Okay? We are equal to men as women. And uh, it's important that uh, we know that women need to be leaders also. In fact, I like to quote Coretta Scott King, Dr. Martin Luther King. I know we just celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday uh, last month, but remember Coretta Scott King, that was his wife. And she is the one that went all around the country uh, campaigning for the, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's holiday. She's the one that did that. But then she had a saying, and I love this quote. She said, we will never have peace in the world until women take power. 
We will never have peace in the world until women take power. So our young women, we have to train them to know that they have to be leaders also. And that they don't have to depend on anybody to support them or protect them or take care of them. They have to know that they have to protect themselves and that they have to support themselves, okay? So our, our young women need to be independent. Thank you, Dolores. I like how you mentioned the children. Can all the children in the room stand up and we give them a round of applause? Because they are the ones, right? You are here tonight with your families. All right. Ms. Huerta is saying we need you and be involved. So we're so glad that you're here tonight. And with that, I'd like to introduce our student ambassadors who will take over the interview, Joshua and Sophia from Crittenden Middle School. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joshua Hackworth. I'm going to be asking a few questions. Um, what suggestions would you give to students in attendance about getting involved in issues related to social justice? Well, I think it's a part for young people to get involved because uh, we're talking about the future of young people. I mean, right now uh, we have to try to save our planet. Uh, we know how we have global warming and that if we don't start taking care of Mother Earth, of our planet, then there's not going to be you know, it's not going to be safe for you and all of your peers, all the young people. And so we have to look at our behaviors. And I think young people can start saying, and young people can point out to parents, you know what you're doing is really hurting our planet. So, you know, you got to change your behavior and the things that you do. So I think young people uh, are actually can be our leaders also. Because I think when, when young people say to a parent, whatever suggestions they give to them, uh, you're wasting water, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, uh, things that you know, uh, you're using too many plastics, you know, things of that nature. I think parents will pay attention because every parent wants the best for their, for their child. Oh, and please study. <laughs> okay, here's another question. What advice? would you give to working parents and the importance of education? I'm going to quote uh, a very famous Spanish philosopher from Spain, and he said this, if we are not educated, if the people in the country are not educated, then the powerful, the greedy, the corrupt will control your government. So we know that we want a, a, a society where everything is fair, you know, where, where people, all of the resources uh, of a country, all of the wealth of a country should be shared by everybody equally. It shouldn't be just a few wealthy rich people, right? So what happens if people are not educated, then that's what happens. And so education has got to be, uh, Fundamental has got to be the basis of everything that we do. And by the way, one of the things that we have to fight for, for you and for Sophia, is that college needs to be free, okay? <laughs> college needs to be free for everybody. And some people say, well, we can't do that in the United States. We are the richest country in the world. The United States is the richest country in the world. But guess what? There are countries in Europe, the Scandinavian countries, the socialist countries. There's a country, little country in Latin America called Cuba. Cuba is a very poor country. People don't have stuff like we have here. But every person in Cuba gets a free college education. And they also have free health care. So if they can do it in a little poor country like Cuba, if they can do it in the countries in Europe, why can't we do it in the United States of America, okay? So this is what we need to say, that we have to fight for this. 
These are rights, these are human rights that we have to fight for. And we can get it, how? By electing good people to Congress, to our state legislature, and by voting, and, and by being informed. And fighting for what we need, right? Fighting for what we need. What do you think about the president's current opinions and how can they apply to your purpose and goals? Our president? <laughs> His opinions? I'm guessing yes. Well, I think our president is not educated, okay? <laughs> Unfortunately. Because if, if, if our president had a good education, he would not say the stupid things that he says. <laughs> He would not be trying to build a wall, <laughs> you know. He would not shut down the government the way that he did and making poor people, and making the workers work without any wages at all. And uh, I think we can, uh, you know, pray for him, hopefully, that he'll get the light. Uh, and in the meantime, start thinking about 2020 when we have the next elections, okay? That's what we have to do. <laughs> So I will be giving the mic to Sophia. Thank you, Josh. So, um, what are you the most passionate about in your work? What am I the most happy about in my work? Uh, well, of many laws, I think that uh, I passed working with different organizations. There was an organization here in San Jose uh, many years ago uh, called the Community Service Organization, CSO. And Cesar Chavez, that's when he joined that organization. I belong to the same organization in Stockton. And we passed some very important laws. Uh, one of the laws that we passed is that for people that, that were, had their immigration status, the people that had their MECA, the green cards, that they could get public assistance. <laughs> and so that would mean uh, if they were blind, they could get aid to the blind. If they were disabled, they could get dis disability assistance. Uh, they could get help of the children, uh, aid to needy children, etc. And if they were elderly, they could get old age pensions. And uh, so we passed that law way back in 1961, before many people in this audience were born. <laughs> and, uh, and then we passed another law in 1986. Oh, but let me back to that law. There's over 15 million people that are uh, uh, legal residents of the United States. Uh, and, and they, uh, they now get the Affordable Care Act, you know, because of that law that we passed way back then. Then in 1986, uh, working with that same organization, the CSO, oh, no, I'm lying, the, with the United Farm Workers, we passed an amnesty bill uh, that people who were here that uh, did not have the documents uh, could get the legal residence in the United States. And about six million people got the residency. And uh, some of you out there that know people that uh, got their legalization under that law, it wasn't Ronald Reagan, okay? It was Senator Ted Kennedy, okay? Uh, Peter Rodino. Uh, uh, Reagan just signed the bill, but it was Senator Ted Kennedy that really helped us get that law passed, okay? So that was a big one that I'm really proud of. So our next question is, how can we become more involved in uh, your foundation here in the Bay Area? How was that again? How can we become more involved in your foundation in the Bay Area? Oh, thank you. Well, uh, you can look at our foundation. We're on, on the web, uh, Dolores Huerta Foundation. Actually, yeah, Dolores, uh, it's, a, it's really simple, DoloresHuerta.org, DoloresHuerta.org, okay? And then we have our website and people can see the kind of work that we're doing. And the major part of the work that we're doing right now is organizing parents organizing parents uh, so they can get involved with the school district. Because we have, not all the school districts are good like this one, okay? <laughs> so we have a great superintendent over here. And then give a big applause, by the way. Please give it to your, your, your heads of your school district here. Some of the school districts are, the, are down there in the Central Valley, in Bakersfield, in that area down there, where all the farm workers live. There's a lot of racism down there. And uh, we have had to file lawsuits against the, our high school district uh, because of the large suspensions of Latinos and African American students. They suspended, in one of the school districts, they suspended 2,000 kids in a, in a year and a half. 2,000. 
and uh, African American students are 600 times higher than white kids. Latino students 500 times higher. Well, we won the lawsuit, and I ha they have to change. They have to change, and so that's what we're working for. And also trying to get good people elected to the school district. Uh, we want uh, people that care about students, care about uh, the children, that they're not there just to get uh, to keep it as a political opportunity to then go on and get another position in government, right? So it's really important that we really uh, see who's going to be on those school districts. And also to make sure that these laws that we talk about are, are passed. Like every school district, they get special money for low-income children, for English learners, for foster children. But some of the school districts, they don't spend the money the way that they're supposed to. That's why we have to organize the parents. And then we say, hey, we want to look at your budget. We want to see how you're spending the money. And we can call them on it when they're not spending the money the way that they should. So that's why it's so important for the parents to get involved, you know, to know what's going on in your school district. It's really important. And the state of California, and Governor Brown and the legislature, they, uh, they have told all the school districts that you've got to involve the parents, okay? But they can say, but then if the parents don't come, you know? So yeah, the, we have to think about how our education system is so important that we've all got to participate and we've got to support the teachers, we've got to support the administrators, uh, because as I said before, our education system is the foundation of our democracy and if people know what's going on, then they will get involved, hopefully, and stay involved. So, how do you think Cesar Chavez could have protested differently? How do you think Cesar Chavez could have protested differently? I still didn't get that. How do you think Cesar Chavez could have protested differently? Cesar Chavez? Yes. Could have done anything differently. It would be different. How could he have protested differently? Well, you know, Cesar Chavez never went to high school. Uh, he had to quit school to help his parents work in the fields. But that means that he, but he didn't, he believed a lot in education. And so that's that even though uh, he didn't get to go to high school, he always had a book in his hand. You know, he was always, always reading. Every time you saw Cesar, he had a book and he was always reading. And actually, uh, when he was alive, what he did is he set up a whole school at the headquarters of United Farm Workers uh, so that the people that were on, the leaders of our different uh, uh, branch committees, so that they could learn how to read, you know? So he believed a lot in education, even though he himself never had a chance to go to school. And we have to remember something, that just because people didn't get a chance to go to high school, or, or maybe they never had a, ch a chance to learn how to read where they came from, that doesn't mean that they're not smart, okay? You know, many are probably, uh, Many of our parents, maybe, and grandparents never had a chance to go to school. They didn't have that opportunity. But they're intelligent anyway. And, and it's interesting because in Spanish, uh, the word uh, educado, educated, doesn't mean that you went to school. It means that you're civil, that you care about people, that you have a social conscience, right? And in, in, like in Mexico, the high schools are called preparatorias. They're called the uh, uh, preparatory schools. So people are getting prepared for a profession. So we just always remember that, that just because a person didn't go to school, like Cesar, you know, that doesn't mean that they're not smart. And that, and, or that you know, we should respect them, you know, for who they are. <laughs> we might have one more question for the last <laughs> We have another question from the audience. It's easy to be discovered in the current political climate, but do you think we are better or worse of than 20 years ago? What was that again? It's easy to be discovered in the current political climate, but do you think we are better or worse of than 20 years ago? Well, in one way, uh, we have a lot of advantages uh, because we have the internet, right? We have the internet, so that means uh, nobody can hide anything from us. We can Google it. <laughs> and, and so people have access to information. Uh, they can also spread information really quick. Like uh, with all of the marches that the women had, for instance, the, the Me Too marches and the march of the, the young people did against guns, 
And you can spread the message really fast, and you can mobilize people, bring them together really fast. So that's good. But I think in some ways, uh, some of the things that I learned in school, and I know you have it here in some of your schools because you're very lucky, but I learned how to play the violin in school. I had dancing lessons in school. And uh, many of the schools now, they don't have art. They don't have music. And so uh, our, our, our whole educational system has been starved. You know, they have been deprived. Uh, I was in the teacher's strike in Los Angeles. Some of the classrooms there, they have 40 children in the classroom. How can a teacher teach 40 children at the same time? So there's a lot of challenges. So in some ways, we're better off. But in other, in, when it comes to education, we have to say uh, we're worse off right now. So that's how we have to fight very hard, all of us, to make sure that we, as I said before, make California number one. And not only California, but the whole country. The whole country uh, needs to be number one in terms of putting resources into our educational system. Our student ambassadors will stay during this portion. Dolores, uh, a round of applause for our students. Aren't we proud of them being engaged? Thank you so much. Um, we do want to mention tonight we have about two more questions to ask as we round out the evening. But we do want to thank you, uh, Dolores, for all of the books that you have personally signed uh, that will be in every library in all of our schools. So we want to thank her for that. Um, do, do you want to talk a little bit about the text and the curriculum? I, I know we have um, a Dolores Huerta Day coming up yes. that we might have the opportunity to explore this in our schools and have the chance uh, to make a difference in our historical conversation. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about that, Dolores, your story, uh, what you'd like to see. Well, uh, I think that the, this book just kind of highlights uh, some of the important things I think that uh, I have done, uh, but also I think it makes it really simple so that young people can look at that and uh, understand it and maybe want to copy it, you know, hopefully. And so I think that's what the important thing is about this book. And uh, the last word today, uh, Governor Brown and the legislature, uh, they, uh, they approved uh, last year that, uh, that my birthday, April the 10th, uh, that will be the Lord's work today, okay? <laughs> now, it's, it's not a holiday. It's not a holiday. It'll be like a recognition a day. But one of the things that we want to ask people on, on the Lord's work today, if you remember that day, is that we do some kind of, of service. Uh, not just uh, doing cleanups, but some, some kind of civic duty. You know, uh, think about uh, learning about uh, some leader, maybe learning about women leaders like Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, like uh, uh, Ella Baker, who was a leader in the African American community, about Dorothy Day, uh, who was a leader with a Catholic worker, about Margaret Sanger, uh, who developed the birth control pill. You know that they put them in jail because they were passing out birth control uh, pills, you know? Uh, and uh, the women that fought for the right to vote for women. You know, so we had to think there was a time when women couldn't vote. And so uh, we're kind of doing, thinking about something civic, uh, you know, remembering uh, some kind of action that people take uh, to, to make the world a better place. That's what I would like to do for Dolores Huerta today. Mm -hmm. I think now that we've had this intimate conversation with you, Dolores, I think we know um, why it's, it's not necessarily a holiday, but a day that we will all be in school, right, everyone? <laughs> um, we definitely will feel you. Is that something we think we want to look into as a school community on April 10th? Awesome. Very nice. Thank you. We look forward to reporting how that works out with you. Um, we have just um, one more question as we close out. Um, our former president-elect, number 44, Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. I think coined the phrase, yes, we can. But I, I, I learned that that originated with you. 
And it's been kind of nice to watch you two, um, as far as being publicized and him crediting you when he gave you the award. But can you tell us where that phrase came from? Don't we want to know where that came from? I, I think it, it was something, where did that come from? Well, the way that happened is uh, Cesar Chavez uh, was doing a water-only fast. He was going without eating for 25 days in Arizona. Because in Arizona, they had passed a law that if a farm worker went on strike, they would put him in jail for six months. And if anybody said boycott anything, that person could go to jail also. And they actually passed that law in Arizona. So Cesar was doing a fast to protest that law. So we were trying to organize the people in Arizona to come and support us, to come and join us, uh, to, uh, to protest against that law. And I met with some of the professional Latinos, you know, the attorneys, you know. And, and so I told them, come and join us. We have to fight this law. And they said to me, oh, Dolores, no se puede, you know. You can't do that in Arizona. You people in California, you can do a lot of stuff, but in Arizona, no se puede. No, you can't. So I said to them, si se puede in Arizona, okay? <laughs> si se puede in Arizona. So, so that's how the place started. And then when I went and I reported to everybody that was meeting uh, that evening, and I reported to them and I said, what I said, si se puede. everybody stood up and they started clapping, si se puede, si se puede. And so that's kind of how it started. So I like to say it came from the universe, right? It came from, because, because si se puede just doesn't mean I can, it means we can, right? It means not only I can do it, but it means that all of us together we can do it. And I think that's the one thing that we have to remember, that all of us together, working together, and like Cesar and Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we, through nonviolence, we don't have to use violence. We just have to use the power of the people coming together and we can make things happen. We can end the racism. We can end uh, the sexual harassment and the misogyny, the hatred against women, the hatred against people that are LGBT, people that are gay, transgender. We can end that, you know? And we have to, we can end people looking down on people because they're not rich, right? We can even make the rich have a social conscience, okay? And, uh, but we can do it all, uh, but we have to do it together. And I like to say something if I can. I like to ask uh, the audience a question, and you've been asking me questions, and I'm gonna ask you a question. And this is a very simple question, and I want you to give me the answer. And the question is basically, I'm gonna ask you, who's got the power? And I want you to say, I want you to say we've got the power. And when I say what kind of power, I want you to say people power. Okay, can we do that? Can we do that? We have it. All right. But I want you to shout it really loud so that the neo-Nazis can hear us, okay? <laughs> All those anti-Semitics can hear people. Uh, the neo-Nazis and the racists and the homophobes and the misogynists, you know, the bigots, like they can hear us. So, okay, so, um, but, uh, so again, you have to shout loud so that you know that you mean it, right? So, okay, I'll answer the question and you give me the answer. Who's got the power? We got the power. Some people aren't sure. <laughs> okay, let's do it one more time. That'll address you, okay? Loud. Let's go. Who's got the power? We got the power. What kind of power? People power. Okay, so are we going to go out there and organize? What do we say? Se puede, no se puede. Let's all do it together with an organized hand clap. Si se puede. Let's go all together. Si se puede. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> there you have it, everyone. Dolores Huerta. Yes, we can in Mountain View, California. Thank you, Dolores. Let's thank her again. Si se puede. We can certainly do it all. Please thank our guest. We'll stay here for a moment. Thank you, thank you for motivating us tonight. Amazing. Yes, we can. Together. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Awesome.